Give it up for Casey. <laughs> ah. They're asking, am I up for the strength thing? I, I think I'll go for the wit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's just good to be here. We want to raise our kids to their classrooms. As they're going, if I could have the attention of all the parents uh, in the house this morning, uh, you know, next Sunday is water baptism. And uh, we've been teaching on it at Sunday school, and informing the kids about it. And so some of your younger uh, children, knowing what's happened in their life, may desire to get baptized. If that's the case, please be sure to talk to someone in the back uh, and prepare. There's a sign-up sheet back there and the like. Uh, just let us know. And next Sunday, we'll rejoice together. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, this week was a big week in the Friedrich family. And uh, I've got a few pictures uh, for you. <clears throat> Come on. That, oh, there he is. Can you believe it? Isn't she beautiful? Yeah. Isn't he handsome? Yeah, all right, that's good. Yeah, yeah I tell you what, what a thrill it was um, for us. We were able to, not able to make that trip. That's, that's happening there, happened there in uh, South Africa, in Pretoria. And, uh, of course, George, uh, uh, Drew, rather, and Lisa will be grabbing a jet here yet today and will be on their way back. They get in uh, Wednesday afternoon, rather late on Wednesday afternoon. And uh, next Sunday, of course, they'll be with us here in the service. And we're really excited about that. Uh, Adam and Carrie are going to come back a day or so later. Adam was preaching this morning in South Africa. And uh, what, a, what a big event for the Friedrich family. That's, that's two down, one to go. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Two down, one to go. Who's the one? The most precious of them all. It's the Abigail. Amen. Oh, let's get into the word this morning. What do you say? I'm looking forward to it because we're in this series, This Is Us. And of course, when we talk about that, that whole concept of this is us, what we're talking about are the values that were the formation of our church that we carry <clears throat> forward even to this day. And, of course, if we're going to fulfill the mission that God has given us, we've got to respond to the values that we have. Our values, they translate into our actions. So last week, you know, Pastor Adam, he spoke of the number one value. How many of you remember what that was? <clears throat> Who was front and center? That's what I thought you said. And so Jesus was front and center. What that means, of course, and how he ministered it, is that in everything that we do is all about Jesus. Think about that for just a second. We come into the house of the Lord, and we begin to worship. Who are we worshiping? Well, Jesus we're worshiping. And then, of course, from that, we begin to preach the word of God. And who do we preach? What are we preaching about? Well, we're preaching about Jesus, the living word. We give. What are we giving to? Well, we're giving to the Lord because the, the work of the Lord can only go forward as we uh, uh, do that. The altar call is given. To do what? Well, to introduce people to Jesus. They go into the back room, and what do we do? We give them a book about following Jesus. And so everything that we do all the way through the service it all revolves around Jesus Christ. We baptize people like we're going to do next week in the name of Jesus. And so everything that we do, serving, we serve as the hands and the feet of who? For Jesus. Amen. Everything. That's the DNA of our church. And I, I, uh, the reason it's the DNA of our church is that's the reason this church was founded. It was so many years ago now, 1985, that Bonnie and I, I had had a revelation of God. I'd had a vision. Supernaturally, God revealed himself to us. He was on a platform, and he was raised up, the light emanating from it. Many of you would know the story. I was introduced to Jesus, so my life was never the same. I was not okay with the deteriorating city of Los Angeles and this whole area. And so we picked up our, our, our baggage, our, our, our home. We moved to Southern California so that we could share Jesus with everybody that we came into contact with. 
So today we want to move on to our second value. And our second value is going to be God's Word is our blueprint. God's Word, the Bible, is our blueprint. It's from the Word of God that we teach. It's from the Word of God that we preach. It's how we know how to uh, live our lives. It's how we find out our purpose for living because the Word of God is the final authority at Praise Chapel, Orange County. Amen. Now, if you didn't notice on your way into church this morning, there in the lobby, the foyer of our church, you'll see an old Bible, and it says on it the verse of the week. I don't know whether you stopped and looked at it, but uh, we're going to have a different person highlight a verse every week as we move forward, and we want you, as you come in, to stop and, and check out the verse of the week. Stop in, open it up, look at it, the precious Word of God. You know, there's a scripture that I want to start with this morning. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. I've got it for you in the overhead. And I want you to just spend a moment, if you would, just a moment to really consider what this scripture says. It says all scripture. So how much of the Bible is we talking about here? Yeah, all scripture is inspired by God. Now, literally, in the original language, that word inspired means it's breathed out. And so, holy men of God, other scripture says, uh, 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 they, they wrote the word of God as they were inspired by God, breathed out. So, God breathes out his word. And so, what is the word for? Well, it's useful. Somebody say useful. useful. It's to teach us. It's to straighten us out. When we're going through issues in our life, it's to recalibrate what we're doing in our lives. It's to put us back into the line of what God intended for us. It, it, it prepares us for a life that's not empty or shallow, but a life that's full of purpose and meaning. And so this scripture, as well as so many others, uh, you can see how central it is to the word, uh, to, to, to our life's purpose. You know, I... I thought about the Word of God being the final authority out of everything that happened at Praise Chapel, and, and I can tell you that that runs very deep in our DNA. And the reason is, is that when I had my supernatural encounter with the Lord, I had this appetite for the Bible. You've heard me talk about it before. It was so intense that I would get up in the morning, I'd get off to work after I started my day, uh, being the owner of my business, I would sit down and I would read the Bible literally all day, and then I would go home and I would read the Bible again till Bonnie actually took my Bible and hid it. <laughs> this is the one. I brought this morning my original Bible. This Bible is so precious to me. Uh, it's a wide-margin Bible. I've got a picture of a page of the interior of this Bible for you uh, this morning. If you'd put that up on the overhead, that'd be a blessing. But this Bible, you can see, it was the wide margin Bible so that as I studied, I could open that Bible up and I could, as God spoke to me, I could begin to uh, uh, write the very things that God was speaking to me about. Look over here to the left and you'll see stains. Those stains were tears. That back, and that would have been prior to 1985, that, that I would have cried over the Word of God as I began to see it and realize, my God, I've got to change the way that I am. I've got to reevaluate who I am, what I'm doing, because the Word of God is so powerful. It's breathed out by God to cause my life to change. So that's why you hear us talk about the Word of God, preach the Word of God, to inspire men to study the Word of God, encourage women to use the Word of God to, to become the women that God has for them. And so this morning I want to look at the importance of the Word of God in Saul's life. Now, this is New Testament Saul. He later became the Apostle Paul. This is previous to his salvation understanding. And so what we know about the Apostle Saul, uh, not the Apostle, but the, the man Saul, is that he was a wonderful Jewish man. 
He was very faithful to his religious training and upbringing. He was raised in the house of God. He was instructed first by his parents and later at the feet of some of the greatest of his time. And he, he lived his life according to his understanding of the word of God. He was very faithful to give the tithe. He was very faithful to be in the house of God every Sabbath, every opportunity, every time the doors were open. He was a prayer warrior in that he was faithful to pray and fast and seek the face of God. But all Paul had was the learned religion and a mental understanding of the word of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 6, the letter, <clears throat> what does it do? What does the letter do? It kills, but the spirit does what? It gives life. And so the scripture would teach us that the Bible is more than ink on a page. It is more than something that was written down for you and I to study or memorize or all the things that religion would get into. It's not just there for us to read. It's there for us to understand through the spirit of the living God. In Hebrews chapter 4, and verse number 12, the Bible says, For the word of God, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between the soul and the spirit of a man. It, be, it, it exposes uh, our innermost thoughts and our desires. Think about that for just a moment. Cast your eyes on that scripture and realize something today. The word of God was there for a reason and a purpose, not to memorize, uh, but to expose our hearts uh, and to shape our lives uh, and to lead us into the way everlasting. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 6 and verse number 63. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is going to profit nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. So up to this point in time, before Saul became the great apostle Paul, all he had was the letter of the law. But then he had an encounter with Jesus. Now Jesus is the living word, right? I mean, John chapter 1 and verse number 14, you know the scripture, and the, f and the word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. We were able to observe the glory of the word of God and the living the living word of God. But here's Saul. He's on his road to Damascus. We know that he is intending to imprison, take the lives of Christian individuals. But the motive inside of Saul's heart is he was trying to do good. Literally, he was trying to do what he knew to be right. The trouble is he was misguided. Do you know that you can try to do good and not understand what good really is? And so here we see that he comes, uh, and, and, and as he's on this way, misguided as he is, trying to do what's right, he has a supernatural salvation experience with the living God. You know the story. Uh, and in that time, there's a revelation, uh, actually three, that are given to Saul. And those revelation is, who is God? Who am I? And thirdly, what is my purpose? These are the same revelations that are available to you and I today. Let me read the story, Acts chapter 9, verse 3. It says this, Saul was approaching Damascus on his mission. A light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And here on the ground, helpless, he cries out, Who are you, Lord? In other words, there's a recognition happening in his life. Oh, I'm, I'm in the presence of someone greater than I. And the voice replied, read it with me, I am Jesus. The voice replied, I am Jesus. Now, 
Again, at this point, Saul is only doing what he knows to be true. The way he was raised, the way he was instructed, the way he was taught, even using the word of God. He was doing nothing but defending God. That's what he was trying to do. I'm going to defend the righteousness of God. But his picture of God was skewed. He saw God as a harsh God, a judgmental God, a strong God that demanded obedience. He saw God as one that was so uh, uh, harsh to people that they would uh, cower before him. How shocked he must have been to have an encounter with Jesus laying on the ground. He doesn't feel harsh. He doesn't feel judgment, even though he's on his way to take persecute Jesus. He doesn't feel that. Instead, he feels loved. Instead, he feels that, that he, he matters to God. And so here he is on the ground. Uh, he feels valuable. Not an angry God, not a vindictive God, but a loving God that interrupted his life. Saul's doing the wrong things, but all he's doing is acting on the misconception that he held of God. Today, most people's actions reflect their understanding of God. It's so sad what happens when we see people that have been influenced by their upraising, their upbringing, their, whether they were churched or unchurched, it really doesn't matter if you go to the universities. We see that there are teachers instructing kids, kids that will not even accept anything by faith. Everything has to become by science, and science, of course, is something that man has invented instead of understanding that science was there to figure out the how we got here and to look into the universe and to see that there was a God that created us. But instead they're being taught by people who've been shaped by an upbringing or a, 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 an understanding, what they've been taught, how they've been instructed. It could have been atheists. You know, atheists today are hostile towards people of faith. They, they, they come at us with like this, this anger, like why well, could you be so small-minded or short-sighted that, 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 that you would believe such a, a far-out thing of, as faith? It could be that they were churched. That's the way I was. I was raised in a Lutheran home. I was identified myself as a Lutheran, which would be a Christian person, much like a, a Catholic would be a Christian person. But I was raised in a church, and in that church, I was told what I couldn't do. They restricted me from enjoying life. I came into the house of God and I had to be quiet. I couldn't lift my voice or shout to God like we did here this morning. I couldn't express what I felt inside of my heart. We had to dress really nice and stand there like little children because children are supposed to be seen, but they're not supposed to be heard. And, 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 and I went to Sunday school. They told us we couldn't dance and we couldn't. Uh, 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 do the things that uh, go to movies and all the things uh, uh, that, 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 that they felt and instructed us that God did not like or God wanted nothing to do with. And so to me, God became a restrictive God. He told me what I could do and what I couldn't do and, and that somehow it would all work out if I could just do a little more good than I did bad, that somehow I might slide into heaven by the skin of my teeth. But, oh, friend, one day I met Jesus. One day, one day he revealed himself to me, and I saw Jesus. He saw the light, the pure light that came forth. I saw the love of God and felt the love of God as it coursed through my being. I began to experience the joy of the Lord as every nation, every nationality, every color of skin, every language type, we all raised our voice and won and began to shout praises unto the Lord, my God. I felt a peace which passed all understanding. I felt something inside of me that was so good, a kind God that loved me, that accepted me just the way I was, and I was far from perfect. Perfect. 
in a matter of moments, my behavior changed. And it changed because I ran into Jesus. He became front and center to me and my family. And all I wanted to do was get to know this God because the vision's over now and I've now I've got to get back to work and raise a family and do all the things that are a part of life. And, and I thought, God, I just want to stay in that vision. I just want to stay in your presence. And I realized I was going to have to put in a little effort. I was going to have to put in a little bit of work. I wanted to know God. And the only way that I could figure out how to know God was to get into his word. And that's why it's a value today. That's why... It is uh, 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 important to us today. I devoured the word of God. That's why our emphasis, because I had a revelation and that revelation was of God. Philippians chapter three, Paul writes uh, about his encounter. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ uh, and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. He said, I'm not satisfied with the letter of the law. I want to know the living God. So the Bible, firstly, gives us a revelation of who is God. Say that with me. Who is God? Let me tell you, God is good. God is kind. God is merciful. How do I know that? Well, because of Jesus. The expression, the word of God, the living word. He came to earth and, and we know that he cared about people. He cared about their physical limitations. He cared about their emotional trauma. He cared about every hurt that they had gone through. And his concern caused him to act. And that action showed us the nature of God. The Bible clearly shows us who God is through the revelation of how he responded to the needs of the world. Acts chapter 10 and 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about, what did he do? He did good and he healed all that were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Friends, that's our Jesus. That's our God. He ran across a woman that good, faithful to the word, the letter of the law, individuals caught this woman in an immoral act and they dragged her out of the house, humiliating her, calling her names and they stood her in the midst of a bunch of angry men desiring to take her life because that's what the letter does. That's what religion does. And instead, Jesus was there. But Jesus didn't respond that way. The world condemns, but Jesus doesn't. He looked at her, and he looked at the man, and he said, go to the one of you that are without sin. Will you cast the first rock at this girl? And then there she stood, naked and exposed. He says, look, I love you, girl. I, I, I don't love what you've done. That's sin. But he said, get up, go out, and change the way that you're living. It was Jesus that came upon Zacchaeus. Who was the key is nothing but a common little thief. Oh, he was heartless. He didn't care about people. All he wanted was what they had. He didn't care that people were under the oppressive rule of Rome. He took the taxes for the Romans, but he kept on taking more and more for himself. I'm sure many men cried in front of him, said, please don't take it. I need it to feed my family. But he didn't even think about it. He just stole it from them. But in spite of that, Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And instead of calling him out and saying, you are nothing but a common thief, how could you do this to people? Instead, he said, Zacchaeus, let's hang out for lunch today. And he went to be with him. He went to his home. 
that was filled with all the wonderful things that he had stolen from other good people. And instead, he says, uh, I love you, Zacchaeus. You don't have to live like this. And the Bible says Zacchaeus' life was transformed uh, in a moment of time. That's our God. In Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4, Paul writes these words and he says, For do you despise the riches of his goodness, of his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing, I love this, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, not the anger of God, not the judgment of God, not the, uh, the, the, the harshness of a God, but the goodness of God. Another translation, the kindness of God leads you to the point where you say, I want to serve that kind of a God. In Psalms 100 and verse number 5, it says, For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, uh, and his truth endures to all generation. God is all-powerful. God is supernatural. His power is used to help us, not for his own benefit, but for ours. Uh, that's where the signs uh, and the wonders uh, and the miracles transpire. It was blind Bartimaeus. Uh, Jesus is walking down the road, uh, and people are hanging on every word that he's got to say. Uh, they're crowding around him as he's dropping gold and nuggets into their lives. Uh, but he hears a voice, uh, a weak voice from the back of the crowd. It's saying, Jesus, have mercy upon me. Uh, and people began to shush him uh, and tell him to be quiet. Uh, he's teaching now. He's very involved. Uh, but Jesus says, wait, I heard a sound. Uh, and, and he calls him to him. Uh, and he says, what do you want? He says, oh, Lord, that I could receive my sight. Uh, and Jesus stopped everything that he was doing because of one man who was hurting. whole society looked at lepers as outcasts. No one dared to touch them. No one dared to talk to them. They were set out outside of the city. But the Bible says a leper came up to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him with compassion in his eyes. Scripture says it this way. Now a leper came to him imploring him kneeling down to him and saying, if you're willing, you can heal me. And then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and did the unthinkable. He touched him. And he said to him, I'm willing. Be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was clean. That's our God. That's who he is. God is good. And God loves you. He cares about you. He's compassionate towards you. He's all powerful. And, and that power is to use for us. Jesus said, what you need to do is ask, amen, and knock and implore. And oh, do everything that you can to get a hold of God. As we study the word, we begin to find out who God is. Second revelation is who we are. This revelation, as important as the revelation is who is God, is this revelation is who we are in the sight of God. Because originally, when God created mankind, he created them to rule, to reign, and to be a partner with him in the purpose of creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. And they will reign over creation. Now I want you to stop and just look at that part of Scripture for just a moment. God, with the living word right beside him, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, they get together and they say, Look, We've made creation, but now let's make the crown of all creation. Let's make one that's like us. Oh, he's not us, but he's like us. Like we reign and we rule, they'll reign and rule. 
and the kingdom that we want to establish, they will partner together with us in the establishment of the kingdom of God. In verse 27, so God created human beings, and he created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, both the man and the woman, the male and the female. He created them, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And what's it say? Govern it. Govern it. Look, I want to tell you something. Governments that are here on this earth are just governments that are here on this earth. They come, they go. They fight, they feud. But let me just tell you something. You and I are to bring down the kingdom of God. We're to rule and reign and govern this earth. We are to speak with authority and power. See, man was created to walk humbly with God and in harmony with God. But of course, in the garden, here's man created in the image of God and they fell into sin. And as a result of the sin, the curse passed to all men. We see this uh, same thing that happened uh, in the life of Saul. Now Saul is a proud man. Uh, he's a boastful man. Uh, he's a self-righteous man. Uh, he thinks he knows more than the other guys. Uh, but in, the, in, in his presence, uh, he's fallen down to the ground. Uh, he is helpless. Uh, he cannot see. Uh, he cannot get up. He is hopelessly overmatched. For the first time in his life, this wealthy, ruling individual, this man of authority is on the ground and he realizes, my pride's not getting me anywhere right now. My plan to go is not happening. I'm under the, uh, some kind of a power that's greater than me. And he was completely powerless before the Lord. And there's the important revelation that I'm talking about. God is God and we are not. Saul found that out laying there on the ground. In verse 4 of Acts 9, it says he fell to the ground. He heard this voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And Saul asked, well, and the voice replied, well, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. And so Saul found himself at the mercy of Jesus. His understanding of right and wrong all of a sudden is completely exposed. The recognition, uh-oh, I may be in trouble here. I don't have authority here. Let me just tell you something. For the first time, Saul was not in control of his own life. And you will find yourself in that same situation. You may think that you're masters of your own life, but let me just tell you something, you're not. You may have some kind of an illusion of control that you can make things happen the way you want them to happen. But let me just tell you something, the day is coming uh, when you're gonna find out uh, it's out of your control. Because the Bible says, God says every knee will bow. Every knee. every knee. Every tongue will confess. Let me tell you, you can do that one of two ways. You can do it now. <laughs> you can do it now. You can get down willingly and say, God, I realize my life is not my own. I'm under the authority of someone greater than I. Or you can wait until judgment day when the Lord looks at you and says, bow. And you say, I'll stand. And you will not stand. You will fall to the ground completely merciless. <laughs> Philippians 2, 9 says it this way. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what name? Every knee will bow, not just those in heaven, but also those on earth, but beyond that, every demon under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You remember Judas. He walked with the Lord. He felt the love and the acceptance of Jesus as he walked with him. 
We know that at a point in time, Judas said, Jesus' program is not lining up with mine. I'm not sure that I want to follow him. And so he concocted a plan. And that plan is what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell the whereabouts of Jesus for some cash. And so he goes and he sells the Lord out. And we know that, 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 that a whole regiment of, of military men come with weapons drawn. And there's Jesus standing. And in John 18 and 6, they came. It says, and they said to him, I am he. They said, we're looking for Jesus. They said, I'm he. And what happened? They fell to the ground. A regiment. Swords, shields, staffs. A regiment. Taking him captive. We'll just take Jesus and we'll take him to the high priest. Uh, but the, Jesus just said, I am he. Boom. This is what happened to me in the vision that God gave me. See, I felt like I was a pretty good person. I felt it because I was taught that way. That was my conception of God according, I mean, compared to this person, I'm doing okay, you know. I, 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 I'm doing a little bit more than good than I am wrong. I mean, you know, I'm not hurting anybody. With I, I go to church occasionally. I, I, I believe in God. It's not like I don't. But, oh, friend, God took the scales off of my eyes. And I saw him for who he was. And he put me in my place. And I knew for a moment, in that moment, that I was a sinner, that I was estranged from God, that I did not even know who he was because I could see where I was before him. I needed to be forgiven. I needed the stain of my sin washed away. I needed to be restored to a relationship with God. And let me tell you something, that takes humility. If you think a proud man or a proud woman can walk to the front of a church and say, uh, I surrender my life to Christ, uh, you have got another thing coming. Because God resists the proud. Uh, he gives grace to the humble. And when we see who we are before him, uh, when we're laying on the ground and we realize our life's not our own, it'll take a hum humble person to say, God. Listen to this. Psalms 130, verse 3. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But, aren't you glad for that word? But, you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I just want you to cast your eyes on that last uh, part, that part of that scripture. But, you offer What's it say? The forgiveness is what? It's offered. And the reason forgiveness is offered is it says that we might what? Learn to fear God. See, when we see ourselves the way God sees us, pride is stripped away. Literally, Scripture says that we stand naked, exposed before him. But it's only then that we can receive new life. Because Scripture says we have to die to ourselves in order to be born again. This is such a critical revelation and I'm speaking to you this morning from my heart and my desire, my concern, that you would understand what God's word reveals to us. God is a good God. And you say, well, you, you, you don't know what I've done. And you're right, I don't. But I can tell you this much, God does. And the word says God is still good. He's gracious. He offers forgiveness so that you might learn about him. When the, what the Bible reveals after restored 
is we become new. The way it says it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, most of you would know the scripture. If any man, if anybody comes to Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. But then it goes on to say, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. John says it this way in the, in the third chapter, that we become born again. Now, what that means is that we become restored to our original state. Remember the original state? We were created in the image of God. So when we come to Christ in humility and when, when we are forgiven and we begin to understand who God is, we're restored to our original condition. We are like God on this earth. And we are to rule and to reign. We are to be people of authority. Are you with me? Now, we see this acted out in the story of the prodigal son. And maybe you've never seen it quite like this. But in that particular story, there's a story of a father with two sons. And the one son lives in, in his father's home. He has all the provision that he needs. He has the love and concern and compassion, everything that he needs in that home. He has authority over the f workers in the field, over the, the whole of, of, the, of the, the, the enterprise that his father has. He has the robe because he is a son of the king or the owner. And so what we see is that at a point in time, that son says, you know, I, I, I don't know that I want to go down this road. I, I'd like to spread my wings a little bit. I'd like to sow a few wild oats. I'd like to see what it's like outside of the kingdom of my dad. And so the Bible says he takes his inheritance and he goes out into the world. And when he goes out into the world, he finds out that Life outside of the Father's kingdom wasn't so good as he thought. He finds himself down, out, and taken advantage of and humiliated. His dignity and his pride is stolen from him. And so in his heart, he says, oh, my God, I need to go back. I, at least if I go back, I can have some kind of a, of a shelter over me, some kind of provision and protection. In Luke 15, he says it this way, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just take me back. Let me be like a hired servant. You see, he didn't understand something, that the father didn't track him down. The father stood his ground and waited for his son to come to his senses. And when his son came to the senses, the father met him patiently waiting for him, and the Bible says he gave him a robe and on the, ro on the and he gave him a ring and he opened a fatted calf or, or slayed the fatted calf. What the father showed him is you're not coming back different than the way you were originally intended. You're coming back to me as a son and as a son you take the ring and the ring is authority. That signet can be a, a, my signature. Everything that I have is yours uh, and use that authority to do business uh, in the world. And I'm giving you a robe because that robe shows a dignity that you have. Uh, you're my son. Uh, I'm proud of you. Uh, I'm not worried about what you did uh, or the fall that you took. Uh, all that matters is now. You're now my son. Uh, and he took the fatted calf uh, and said, let's celebrate uh, because provision, everything Everything that you need, uh, everything that you desire, it's here at my table. And so the Bible reveals to us, this is our state after we're restored. What you believe about yourself is important. I don't know whether you heard me. I'm not sure whether you understood what I'm saying. But what you believe about yourself is really important. 
as followers of Jesus Christ, we are sons and daughters of the king. You know who we are? We're powerful people. <laughs> Why? Well, we got the name of Jesus. <laughs> are you kidding me? Is that the same name we talked about earlier, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow? Is that the same name that, that was used that every demon spirit has to bow its knee? Is that the same name that was used to heal the sick and bind up the brokenhearted? Is that the same name? Is it the same blood that we've been given that you and I could go out and plead the blood of Jesus Christ? Let me tell you something. Every demon in hell begins to flee out the door when we say uh, we stand uh, under the blood of Jesus Christ. We've got the word of God. We can speak to the devil and say no weapon formed against me is going to prosper because my God has given me that. Greater's he that's in me than he that's in you. Better get out of my way because I'm a woman. I'm a man of authority. That's who we are. So yes, we come in humility. And we stand in humility. Oh, but after Jesus, after restoration, we become something. This is us. This is who we are. We walk out the doors of this church. We're not begging. We are going in the name of the Lord. There's a third revelation. And that revelation is the Bible reveals our purpose. This is the big question in life. This is the one, I think, that, that, that causes more people to stumble, struggle. They can't understand, why am I here? Why do I have to go through all the stuff? The pain of life, the hurts of life. What's my purpose? Why am I here? And without revelation, this third revelation that comes to us from the Word of God, we become... We, we remain insecure. We search, but we never find. We live below what God intended for us. But the revelation in the word of God clearly reveals our purpose to us. Now, in the story of Saul that we've been reading about, Saul's laying on the ground. He's prostrate before God. He certainly saw God for who he was. God is a good God. God's a compassionate, caring God. He became well aware of who he was before God because he's laying there on the ground. And then the words on the ground spoke to Saul the reason for his existence. In Acts chapter 9 and verse number 6, then the Lord said to him, Saul, arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Now, we know that when that happened, God spoke to a disciple of the Lord and told him to meet Saul and speak to him, and God, the living word, gave him the words to speak. In verse number 16, Ananias, that disciple, spoke to Saul and said, but rise Stand to your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which you are still going to be revealed to you. And you're to open the eyes in order to turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, so that they may, might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So here's Saul lying on the ground and God speaks to him and says, Stand. Let me tell you something. God doesn't want you down. He wants you up. Yes, come on. And there come the word of the Lord, the living word, and it was a revelation for his purpose. He found out that his design for his life was not God's design. 
He understood that his feelings of right and wrong were not God's understanding of right or wrong. He realized, I have now become an ambassador for the kingdom of God. And everywhere he went, and everything that he did, he was to do that. didn't matter whether he was preaching a sermon as an apostle or whether he was making tents to earn a living. He was to share what God had done. And so there, as he's making tents, a couple, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, are working with him, and he inspires them for greatness. When he was traveling, when he went to Berea or Mars Hill, he didn't just hang out, but he began to share with those that were philosophers. He began to speak to them about them worshiping an unknown God and how that God could be known. When he was engaged in conversation, as he went to Philippi, and he went down on the river as he would to, to pray, he saw a woman who was a, a businesswoman, and he began to share with her and testify to her, and she became central in the formation of the, one of the most powerful churches that ever was. And let me tell you, the revelation of what's our purpose in life is the same for us as it is for Paul, because we were created in the image of yes, God. That's right. God saves us for a purpose. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 4, it says, He comforts us, God, comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, then we're able to give them the same comfort that God has given to us. Now, let me tell you something today. This is dignity. Yes. He said, if you believe in me, how, how many believers do we have in the house today? Anybody believe? Yes. He said, yes. these signs will follow you. All that believe, these signs will follow you. In my name. We were given that name, right? In my name cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll cast out demons. Perform miracles. Things that Jesus did and greater things. Let, let me just tell you something. We were saved so that we could go out and bear fruit for the kingdom. You say, well, you know, my job has me busy. I understand. Paul's did too. You do live for God. When you begin to study through the Word of God, make it the blueprint for your life, can I tell you something? All of a sudden, your life has a platform from which to speak. I was talking to Jordan just before the service today, and he was telling me about power that's happening when you elevate services. Young people are beginning to share from the pulpit what God's laid on their heart. He was talking to me about several that came up and said, I'd like to, to share. And, and, and Jordan, it just came out of his mouth. He said, you know, it's not so important that you have a microphone to amplify your words. What's important is that your life amplifies what you say you believe. And I told him, I said, the way I've always taught that is that there's a platform from which a preacher preaches. It's wood or marble or whatever they have. But the platform for ministry is not wood. It's a life that has used the blueprint yes. of the Word of God. Yes. This morning, I was preparing to speak, and it's in my office, and I got an email from Adam. You know, something about us that when we're gone, we're still thinking about the body of Christ here. 
PCOC. This is what he texted me. It means a lot to me. He said, have fun today, Dad. God's Word is our blueprint. You don't have to preach about a life built on the truth of the Word of God because that's exactly what you are. I can't tell you what a joy it is for me to see young men preaching, speaking, leading, praying, all of the revival things that are happening around the house of God. So exciting for me. And I know that that as Bonnie and I age, we may not have the same level of input, but our, I shouldn't say that we may not have the same level of public speaking, but we have input because of a life, the DNA, the, the, the very purpose, the very values of our church that were instilled so many years ago, back in 1985. I want to tell you something. If you don't have one of these, if all of you have is a phone with the Bible on it, I want to tell you something, church. You should go out and get one of these. This was the most expensive Bible that I could find back then. I wanted a good Bible. I wanted one that I could study. And the life that I have, the life that, well, through the generations that it's because I got to know God. If God would have kept track of all my sins, there would have been no hope for me. But He offered me forgiveness and I took it. Amen. And I learned, I learned what it took to be a man of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over the auditorium this morning in the presence of of the Almighty. Jesus, we ask you now that you would indeed meet with us here today in this altar service. For Father, we've worshipped Jesus. We've given to Jesus. We've preached Jesus. Now, Lord, we offer an opportunity for people to meet Jesus. Father, this is not something that we take lightly. Something, Father, that is like the most important thing that could ever happen. And Father, I thank you for those that have been saved these last weeks. But Father, I pray this morning that the good God that's revealed to us in the living word would reach down and touch hearts this morning. And Lord, if there would be one here today that does not know you, is not born again, is not living life the way you intended. Is, is, is that the product of suffering? I pray, Lord, that you would draw them to you. And that, Lord, they might become, as you intended, people of dignity and worth. In Jesus' name I pray. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me make a, a call this morning. If you're here today, do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know that that might sound sort of like a cliche type of thing, but listen to what I'm really saying there. I'm not saying if you've ever gone to church or as I did when I was a part of the Lutheran Church, believe in God. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, have you ever been born again? Have you ever been restored to who God originally intended you? And if you haven't, I invite you today, as Jesus did, he offers us forgiveness so that you might learn of him. And if that's you, I want you with it real quickly. No one looking around, just no one here to embarrass you, just simply slip a hand up and say, well, that's me, Pastor. I want to I wanna know Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him today real quickly with an upraised hand just up and right back down right before the Lord. Jesus. Jesus. There could be no greater decision. No greater decision. It alters the course of your life. It restores dignity. Jesus offers this
words to you this morning. If there be one, with an upraised hand, real quickly up and right back down. Before we change the altar of this service, I'll wait for you just one more moment. I know God is dealing with someone. So in just a moment, I wait. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me just change this for just a moment. How many of you know the Lord and you're satisfied with the knowledge that you have of the Lord? If, if that's you, I'd ask you to stand to your feet. You're satisfied. change that again and say it this way. So how many of you, like the Apostle Paul, say, everything else doesn't matter except for the knowledge of Christ. And then he goes on to say, I want to know him and the power. I want to experience it in my life. I want that. If that's you, maybe you can stand to your feet. That's satisfying. I want to know so grateful for what's happening at Elevate. Young people that are experiencing the move of God. So thankful what's happening here as people experience the moving of God. Maybe you're outside of that and you're saying, I want to know more. Friends, the way that you do that is through the Word of God. I want to challenge some folks here this morning. I spoke it earlier. If all you have is a cell phone. They're wonderful. I, I read the verse, the, the, uh, the reading plan on my cell phone as well. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down in any way. But if you don't have a book where you've cried over it, you've stopped to meditate on it, you've highlighted it, it's spoken to you and said to you, this is a course correction for your life. To change here. If that's not happening in your life, I'm going to challenge you today to go out and buy the most expensive Bible you can find. I'm not talking some cheap thing that you can't even see the words except for with a magnifying glass. I'm talking about a dandy leather. Go for the real deal. Pass on bonded, go the full thing. Because at PCOC, it's everything we believe, it's everything that we preach, it's everything that we do, all wrapped up in God's living word. Let me pray over you. Father, I pray that as people, your people, study your word. That you give them the insatiable appetite that I had, Lord, at my conversion not be satisfied with the surface understanding, Lord, and misunderstandings that they have accumulated from their past, but they might dig new wells, dig into the Word of God. Lord, make the Word of God so that it would speak to them, challenge them. Lord, I pray that as we realize that the Word is Jesus, that the Word reveals to us who God is, who we are, what is our purpose. Lord, that it would change the trajectory of our lives. Help us to change the world one person at a time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you give God praise? Listen, when you exit today, before I know you'll stay, talk and share it. But when you're looking, go out and, and read the verse of the day. Find that Bible. Read the verse of the day. And then make it part of what you do. When you come into church on Sunday mornings, go to that book. Check in with God. Check in with the Word. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Have a great day.